Alrighty, it is that time. That time to get started, happy church. All right, you have said your Christmas greetings. It is time to begin. We are headed to Philippians chapter 2, taking a break from our normal verse-by-verse study through the Gospel of Matthew. We have been going through chapter by chapter there, but taking a break for the Christmas season. After Christmas time, we'll dive back into the Gospel of Matthew, picking up where we left off. But right now, we're headed to another uh, Christmas passage to inspire our hearts about the God who loved us so much. He sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him, how easy is that to be saved, to, to miss out on eternal judgment and enjoy eternal life in what Jesus called the paradise of God just simply by trusting in Christ. That's the wonder of Christmas. Let's pray together. Now, Father God, as we look to your word, we pray that the Holy Spirit is with us, would lead and guide us, God. We pray, Father God, that you would open the eyes of our understanding, God, so that we could see and hear this word. You have ordained our footsteps. Nobody is gathered here by accident. We're here because you have led us to this place for this word. So let us hear what the Spirit is saying so that we could be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, sadly, the very first Christian church established there in Europe in a town called Philippi, which is modern-day Greece there, uh, happened to be having a huge struggle. They were... uh, under the threat of just being torn apart from within. They were a church divided. There was a lot of pressure on them. It was a beautiful church there. It got started with a few little people. The Lord gave the Apostle Paul uh, a vision of uh, coming over from mainland Turkey, crossing the Aegean, Aegean Sea, over to Greece, as I said, there, and uh, started a church with what? Uh, just the, there was Lydia, this businesswoman. God opened her heart. Then there was a fortune teller, a sorceress, who was possessed with a demon, and Paul took care of that. And then she became part of the group. And then that jailer who witnessed that tremendous miracle. Paul and Silas were singing hymns. They were unjustly thrown in prison. And and as they sang praises to God, God just got excited and shook the place. And their chains fell off and the doors flew open. And the jailer said, what must I do to be saved? And so Paul said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. As I just said, how Easy as that, right? And so they believed and they were baptized right there because they go hand in hand, don't they? And so uh, not long after that, the church was thriving. God had a foothold in the continent of Europe the very first time. And uh, not long after that, of course, as the Church was growing, and lives were being dramatically transformed, and people were leaving Zeus and Aphrodite for the true and living God, coming to the knowledge of the truth and being saved. Things were really good until, of course, the devil caught wind, and you didn't think it was going to take a foothold in Europe, uh, sitting down and not pushing back. And so we Don't wrestle against flesh and blood so much as the people. It's the spirit behind that opposes God. And he stirred up some trouble for them. And when there were all kinds of mandates there against gathering there in Philippi, if you did, you could lose your job or your life. Uh, Certainly you would be persecuted and all of that. And that made people edgy and anxious and fearful. And when that happens, then there can be strife. Right? People get cranky when they're fearful and insecure and all of that. And so the, the church was threatening to be pulled apart uh, because of the division 
There were some false teachers around that was, were throwing them into confusion and dividing up everybody. So some people said, hey, I like what that guy's teaching, but it was, he was a heretic. So it was splitting the church. And on top of all of that, what added to the divisiveness of the church were two loving ladies, their names in English, Fragrance and Fortune. But it wasn't a good fragrance, and it was more like misfortune, because the two of them had a falling out, and knives were out. <laughs> and they were mad at each other, and it was causing families to take sides. And the church was cold and cliquish, and everything God doesn't want a church to be. And as Jesus said, a house divided is a house that's going to not stand. It's going to be destroyed. And so uh, Calvary Chapel Philippi was ready to come apart at the seams. And their pastor, founding pastor, was away evangelizing, got tossed into the slammer himself. And he was going to write a letter now to call them back to their senses. This is a serious problem. And uh, he is going to try to inspire them to get their acts together, to lay aside their differences, and to have a humble attitude, not making everything about themselves, and so many being offended and having grudges and all of that. He said, something bigger than your personal little problem is going on in your midst. There is a God. The world is lost. We need to humble ourselves and work together in one spirit with the same love, with the same uh, like-mindedness. And so he wants them to be restored, and he's going to tell them how to do that. And really, he's, here's what he's going to say. You've got to walk worthy of the gospel, of what God has done for you, and uh, worthy of the great act of love that God would come into this world. And he's going to talk about that. And really what he's saying is... You gotta walk worthy of Christmas. You gotta think about what God did by coming into this world and how you have benefited and then respond accordingly. Let's take a look now. Philippians chapter two, starting at verse one. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, oh, and you you do. If any comfort from his love, oh, there's a whole lot of that. If any fellowship with the Spirit, yeah. If any tenderness and compassion, yes, 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 then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interest of others. He goes on. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, didn't consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage is really the meaning there, something to be grasped and used. But he laid that aside, but he made himself nothing. He emptied himself of all of that, taking the very nature of a servant, a slave, being made in human likeness, God, and being found in an appearance as a man, when he was more, right? He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God the Father exalted him, God the Son, to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We're going to park there and consider these awesome thoughts that are, are meant to have a response in our hearts. How then should we live having a god like him who has done what he has done, who's given us quite the example indeed. And so 
He's now kind of busting out the big guns. The church is going to split up and come undone if something miraculous, if God doesn't intervene and they don't get their acts together. So he's going to bring out the big guns, spiritually speaking, or crack open the smelling salts and like, wake up. Wake up. Think about it. Are you really a Christian kind of thing? How can you be living like, a, you know, on a high horse when your maker, your master is lowly and hard. And so he expects us to respond this way and have the attitude of Jesus. That's the way to spiritual maturity. And so he's saying, my dear, dear Philippian friends, stop asserting yourself and learn to walk humbly with God and with others in a life of service. And easier said than done. So uh, it divides quite nicely. This is our, our talking points are going to be the first one. Really humble yourselves. Live your life as a response to God's love. Let that, what God has done for you, let that motivate you to do for God. Anything difficult in the Christian life, do it as a response of thanking God for saving you. It's so much easier that way. So uh, live your life as a response to God's love, verses 1 through 4, right? And note takers, verses 5 through 8. Live your life by imitating Jesus. Have the same kind of mindset that your Lord, you're following him. You're supposed to be Christ-like. So be like Christ by imitating his attitude. How did he go about life? You're called to do the same. And then finally... Live your life humbly by remembering the glory to come. And that's just a beautiful thing in the closing verses of our passage. And so we have all the inspiration we could ever need right here in the opening paragraph. Here is this great appeal. And he's just, he's just, well, it's from the Holy Spirit. So it's masterful in how he's going to get you to, to, to realize, whoa. What am I doing? I need to repent, right? So here are your verses, one through four. What I like to do is kind of paraphrase, walk through it in an extended way, uh, just kind of help it sink in. And so time for some rhetorical questions, my friends. I'm going to ask you some questions to think about, right? He's going to say, uh, uh, are you glad that Christ saved you, <laughs> right? Verse one, that God actually took your hell-bound spirit and then joined it to him instead of sending you and letting you go off of your way. You happy about that? Yeah. Does that make you happy? That's what he's saying. You know, that's the question. Uh, has, God love, has God's love made any difference in your life? The comfort, the, the encouragement. Is it wonderful to have the Holy Spirit in, in your heart knitting you to his heart and to the hearts of God's people to enjoy his love. Do you enjoy that? Are you glad for that? Uh, and that's what he's asking here, you know, and you're like, yeah, of course. I mean, are you happy for his mercy and his loving kindness? Verse two, if these things are true, then on top of that, go ahead and make your founding pastor who's suffering in prison, bring a little ray of sunshine to your, to your pastor who brought you the word, now is in jail. Make me happy by coming together and laying everything aside and having the same heart. That's what he's saying there. And he's saying by being like-minded, united, and the same love, living for the same uh, purpose, one in spirit. Okay, so we're diving in here, and here's this is just huge about the Christian life. The Christian life is hard but not so hard when you live it as a response to what Christ has done. To forgive someone's hard, but if you keep in mind all the sins that you've been forgiven and the mercy shown you, then from that place, you're able to cut people all the mercy they need, all the slack they need, because you've been forgiven a lifetime of sins. And this is the whole idea here. He's asking you, have you benefited? Are you happy you're saved and not going to hell? I, I mean, you really could have, right? God, God did, I mean, God saved me almost against my will. I wasn't looking to be saved. I was looking to party. I was 19, you know the story. I went into a bar, 19 years old. I had a vision in a bar. I wasn't looking for God, but I came out a born-again Christian. 
And so Paul would say, are you happy about that, that you're not going to perish? But God came in, took you by the scruff of your soul and said, I'm not going to let you destroy yourself. Right? Aren't you glad about that? Oh, yeah, you sound like it. <laughs> <Woo -hoo. laughs> One writer said, listen, sloppy or sinful or self-centeredness that's allowed to creep back into a Christian's life is most often due to a lapse in memory. The more enamored we are and grateful for the love God has shown us, the more humble, gracious, and the more other-centered we will be. That's just the way it is, you know? Second Peter chapter 1 says, hey, I want you to add to your faith brotherly kindness and add to that um, self-control and add to that goodness and add to that and keep adding these virtues. And then he goes on to say something that flows into this thought here. He says, if you lack these qualities, he says, you're nearsighted and blind as a Christian. And you've forgotten that you've been cleansed from your past sins, you see. So when we become hard-hearted to all the good ways we've benefited from God, that Jesus was on that cross thinking about me, suffering and anguish, and he didn't have to include me. He included me and he included you. He didn't have to. A lot of people are going to perish. How did you get so blessed to be not the one that on the wide road that leads to destruction that many go in, but only, he said, a few only, comparatively speaking, will be saved on the straight and narrow path? How did, are you, here's what Paul's saying. Are you happy about that? Then let it show by your humble life, by not being a part of the problem but by being part of the solution, by serving, by brokering peace between people. They're not being a troublemaker or somebody who's full of themselves, but just full of gratitude and humble and heart. We would... <coughs> Sorry, it's just the cough, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I swallowed the wrong way, I promise. <laughs> I was in Home Depot, and I did the same thing. I coughed in line, and the whole store went. <laughs> I was like, I'm choking on my own spit. <laughs> we can cut that whole part out of the tape. <laughs> we say to the Lord, how could I ever repay you? And he'll say, work with me. Help me. I, I have something I'm doing. Gather with me. I mean, if somebody gave you a kidney, the last second you were dying and he donates your kidney, and then one of his kids is in need, are you going to be rude to the kid? Are you going to be rude and insensitive to his children? He's our father. He has children. He saved us. We're going to treat them poorly or be a problem to them. That's the idea. So he, he's kind of saying, what kind of ingrate would, you know, gulp down all the salvation, all of God's love, all of God's mercy, be forgiven a lifetime of sins, as I've been saying, uh, the comfort, receiving the comfort. He says the word comfort there means a soothing sympathy that heals your wounds emotionally and empowers you and strengthens you, that word. And the fellowship that God has shared his life with us. He knit us together to, to participate in the divine nature, as Peter tells us. This is crazy. So he says, are you happy to be co-heirs with Christ and have all this unmerited favor? I think you get the point. But Jesus drives it home this way when he tells the parable of the unmerciful servant. Matthew chapter 18, he says, let me tell you a story about a guy. He owed two million bucks. He was about to get thrown into debtor's prison. Him and his kids and his wife. Debtor's jail, the worst for the rest of their lives. He had no way of paying back 50 bucks, let alone $2 million. And he's like throwing himself on the ground. And the master says, you know what? I'm just in a good mood. I'm going to let you off the hook for $2 million. Done. Get up, go your way, live your happy life. He goes out, he sees a guy who owes him 20 bucks. 
He grabs him by the scruff of the neck, and he enraged. You owe me 20 bucks, man. Pay up. Well, word got back to his master who let him off the hook, and he called him in. And he said, let me get this straight. <laughs> I let you off the hook of $20 million, whatever it was, 2 million bucks. And some guy owes you 20 bucks. And you're going to treat him like that? And the whole point was there was a disconnect. The guy could never have possibly ever in his heart truly known the love and the forgiveness of God to be such an ingrate to go out and do something like that. And so that's his point. Uh, do you love God? Has he been good to you? Do you appreciate all the good things God has done for you? And do you love me? He throws that in. He's Jewish. He knows how to manipulate the emotions. <laughs> As a Jew, I can say things like that, right? I had to grow up with that kind of manipulation. And I mean, do you love me? I've been suffering here, you know? Do you want to make my suffering worse? Yeah, no, you want to make it better, right? And wouldn't it be nice for me to get a letter back saying that you guys have dropped all your differences and you're, you're responding together in God's love and you're fixing the problems and all of that. Bring me a little sunshine, folks, right on top of doing it for the Lord. And so he piles up all those words there, like-mindedness, same love, one in purpose. They all mean the same thing, but here's what he's, why he's piling up the words. The words in Greek are so deep and so rich. It's not like a Band-Aid where everybody's going to walk around and pretend and fake like, oh, okay, I'm happy, you know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry too, but you don't mean it, right? He's talking about this rich divine intervention, this change of heart that is now so well-rooted. It's a unity where the roots of our souls are brought together at depths and a strength that would weather any storm that could threaten this church family. It's a oneness that comes, as one scholar said, a oneness that comes from heaven that binds us together with the cords of God himself. And uh, there's also an illustration in there about redwood groves, that redwood trees grow in groves. And the reason you don't usually see one down in a storm is because they in intertwine their roots together. And they're one for all and all for one. And, you know, if you're going to blow one over, you're going to have to take the whole grove down. And that's the understanding. You're going to take one of us down? Oh, no, you don't. No, we'll all go down with the one because we're so like-minded, we're so solid in our purpose. And what's the purpose? Hey, there's a God in heaven. The world is lost. Jesus is coming. Time is short. He's counting on us to live for him. That's the bigger picture. That's what's essential, that we unite our lives around the bigger truth that's more important than what's going on in our little individual lives. Amen? Verse 3, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Ambition can be good. God puts that in people's hearts to excel at what God has made us good at, that we might bring glory and honor to him, take care of business. Nothing wrong with that. But when you turn ambition inward, oh, it's a terrible thing. In fact, James calls it this way, where you have uh, selfish ambition, there you will find chaos in every evil practice. And why does a self-centered life do such harm? Because it's the antithesis of how God designed life to be. So when somebody's living in the opposite way that God has designed self to pour out, but instead it's all about them, then everybody in the radiance of that self-centered person is going to suffer because they're doing life wrong. They're doing life not the way God has designed life to be. And so he says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. He's saying, in other words, those who would make decisions that just benefit them at everybody else's expense. It doesn't matter. I want that. I think that. That's my opinion. So what? Deal with it. That's the spirit behind what he's saying, do nothing 
with selfish ambition. In other words, one writer said this. He could be saying, stop living like you're the center of the universe because you're not. Uh, Like your feelings are the only ones that matter. Like your needs are the only ones that are important. Like your opinions are the only ones that are right. You see? That's what a self-centered, selfish ambition, that's what it looks like. And so, yeah, something bigger is going on. So he says, in humility, following along in the text, consider others better, meaning more significant, more important. You revere them more than yourself, right? They're the important one. The the one standing in front of you is the the important one. Instead of sizing everybody up and thinking, where am I in this? You always know you're below. You always put yourself, when you're sizing somebody up, you always say, they're more influential, they're more um, significant than I am. This is a realistic view, really, of where we belong. He's saying, listen, lowliness of mind is what humility means. It means low to the ground. It's hard to come by because we are usually filled with pride. It's all about us trying to impress people, to think more highly of us than is merited, right? And he says, that's what gets you into trouble. You should start off, start out low, And the way to do that is to remember what you are without God's grace, who you really are, how wretched your sin is, and how desperate and and helpless you are. That keeps you low to the ground. And now it's not a neurotic, self-loathing kind of thing where you walk around like Eeyore, I'm a terrible person. (laughs) You know, it's not like that. It's just realizing what your life would be and who you would be if God hadn't saved you, if God didn't cover you with his gracious hand. And so when you have a heart like Jesus, Jesus said, my heart is lowly. He said, you can come to me. Oh, anybody who's weary and heavy burden, don't be intimidated because I'm meek, I'm gentle, and quote, lowly in heart. God says, this is an attribute in the Godhead. God is lowly of heart, therefore we as well. Well, lowly in heart, people don't have to always be right, don't always assert themselves, have the last word, but they're quick to apologize. You know when you're low and you make yourself low, there's less of you to offend, right? That's really the idea there. So, yes, consider others better, more significant, as we've been saying. You'll pay more attention. So if, if you're thinking, oh, that's just so-and-so, ordinary so-and-so, whatever, they're just sitting there. But if you start thinking them in other terms, then you'll pay attention better, you'll be more ready to help them, you'll treat them with more respect because they're important instead of relegated to whatever. They're just, you know, in your thinking. So the story's told about a famous American evangelist, somebody like Moody. He went and traveled to a church where nobody knew his wife, but his wife came along. And so uh, they were there. She's an ordinary, plain-looking woman, very modest, you know. And uh, she's in the lobby before he preached, and she needed some assistance, but everybody's just passing her off and not paying attention and not very helpful at all. Kind of insensitive to her, actually. And then during the service, he said, and I want to, I don't usually have my wife with me, so I'd have my wife uh, stand, and they at the church recognized her. It was a big church, too. And uh, he, she came up on the platform and then sat down, and he finished, the, he did his sermon. Afterwards, she noticed a real change, and she told her husband, man, it was like I'm now a celebrity. Now, everybody wanted to help me. Everybody was around me. Everybody was asking me things. And um, so friendly and kind. And I didn't have to, I mean, I just looked a certain way. And boom, three people were there, ready to go. Do you need something? After all, now, in our thinking anyway, what has changed? What has changed except in your thinking? Now you're thinking of her as, oh, she's connected to D.L. Moody. That's his wife. Oh, so now, now suddenly, 
Right, and so he uses that illustration for this passage and says, why don't we start thinking about the nobody who's sitting in church as the bride of Christ? Oh, yeah, you think it's a nobody sitting there, but when you get to heaven, you're going to see who that nobody really was <laughs> related to him, the king of kings. And so we, he just says, just go into the room and just think they're all important. They're all important. Why? And of course they're all important. They're made in God's image and bought with his blood and destined to sit on a throne with God. That's what God says. Revelation 3, that's where we end up, reigning and ruling with Christ. That's an important person there. They don't look at it at the moment, but they are. Oh, one thing, David Guzik, an acquaintance friend of mine, a pastor in Santa Barbara, my wife and his wife are friends. Uh, if I consider you above me and you consider me above you, then a marvelous thing thing happens, we have a community where everyone is looked up to and no one is looked down on. Amen? I like that. And notice, by the way, he says it's not wrong for you to look out for your own interests. Of course, we're supposed to do that. He says, just don't leave it there exclusively today. What do I need? Yes, you have to take care of what you need. But also, and Jesus would say this, Love others the way you love yourself, right? So the way you're thinking all about yourself, just apply that to the other. The neighbor always means whoever's standing there that God has brought you into your sphere of influence. And so and that's what he's talking about there. So let's move on here. Paul cuts to the chase now. He's going to say, attitude check, is it like Jesus? And then, there it is, <laughs> your mindset should be the same as Jesus, even though he's equal to God in every way. He didn't use that for his own advantage. He laid that aside, right? And, and he emptied himself of all of that, and he took on the nature of a slave and went to that cross, uh, found in human likeness. He became one of us. And this is an amazing thing. Humbled himself in obedience to death, and then he just says, and by the way, no ordinary death for God, for God. He chose to die for our sins on a Roman cross. That's pretty amazing. And so now here we are. Now the Christian life is to strive for the same attitude and mindset of Jesus, which, by the way, is the whole point God's program, the overarching theme of God's purpose over your life, I promise you this, it's, it's biblical, is to make you perfect like Christ. He's working all things together for good to conform you to his image. In other words, as morally pure as Jesus. Jesus is the perfect human being. And he says that's all the only human beings in heaven will be perfect. And so we start the project when you come to him, the spirit comes in and raises you to new life, which is supposed to cooperate with the overarching theme. Let's make you perfect, as morally perfect as a human being can until death. Then we, at death, we are raised and wake up in his likeness. It's complete when we see him. And so he's just saying, just get, on, get with the program, cooperate. You know, if you're being self-centered or proud or part of a problem or divisive or bickering, that's just, you know, it's a waste of time. And that's why he says, he called it in the last paragraph, vain conceit, because it, it, it's a waste of time. You're not gaining anything, right? So you end up in heaven, maybe, without a lot to show for it. That's really the point there. So cultivate this mindset that you see in Jesus. And how can we do that? Well, we have the Holy Spirit. We have the mind of Christ. We can tap into the attitude. And I don't know about you, but almost in every situation I'll be in, when I'm about to respond, I get some options. <laughs> the Lord presents some options. We can go with, you know, well, you know, or we can go with what Christ would do. And he always, in a split second, you choose the road. All of a sudden, a road map appears before you. It's like, do you want to go with your own natural, sinful 
a worldly reaction or do you want it to go higher? Because it's available, it's here, just asking. And you have the choice. And we choose, that's what we do. And we just have to practice. So every morning you wake up, the slate's clean, he says, let's try again. <laughs> every single morning and every single evening we confess our sins and say, oh man, I took the wrong road so many times today. He goes, okay, let's wipe that all clean because though all those sins are paid for and let's start fresh and anew right now. Why don't you get up and go wash the dishes? <laughs> and then we say, can we start tomorrow? <laughs> I want the mindset of Jesus tomorrow, <laughs> not tonight. <laughs> All right. Okay. And so, yeah. Okay. So here's where he starts. He goes, imagine this, that it's God who is humbling himself. So usually the more power, the more prestige, the more position of authority, the greater the struggle with pride and bossing people around and wanting to be served, right? Because when you're a celebrity or a prime minister, uh, you're not shining the shoes. You're having your shoes shined, right? But God, God <laughs> came to shine shoes, as it were, to clean up messes he didn't make to do the job nobody else wanted to do because it would make them look low. So he did it. But this is an amazing thing that who is this Christ? And he starts out saying, even though he was God, wow, God in a body. As one hymn has it, lo, within the manger lies he who built the starry skies. Look at this in Colossians chapter 1. This is who your Jesus is. The Son is the image of the invisible God. That word means the exact representation of his being. It's God stamped into human flesh and blood. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 says the exact same thing. He's the image of the invisible God. For by him, this one who comes to wash dirty feet... All things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, doesn't matter, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities. All things have been created by this carpenter and for him. He's before all things and in him holds, he holds everything together. And yet he says, okay, you've got some dirty feet. Take your sandals off. I'll get a, a wash bucket. I'll put on you know, a little apron here and I'll get busy doing what you guys don't want to do. The, the mind-blowing thing is, is that he's God <laughs> and he's doing it. And then he says, you're my servants and are, are, is it beneath you to do certain things, to humble yourself? Wow, this is crazy that he is God. Colossians 2.9, the fullness of God in a human body. He existed way before Bethlehem. He's always existed with God. So in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word that was God was made flesh and blood and dwelt among us. God come to visit that is crazy. And he said, I, I don't know about you, but I came to give my life away as a ransom payment. He said, I didn't come to be served, and I'm the Lord. So what, what about us? What about us? So he says, yes, verse 6, he's very God of very God, but he didn't use that fact to his own advantage. And I'll say, man, born in a stable, he's choosing where he's going to end up. He's born in a stable and laid in a feeding trough where cows could come and eat God who created the world, laid in the manger, born into a working class family, raised in Podunk, Nazareth. That's exactly what Nazareth was. Can anything good come out of Nazareth, a place like that? He learned to trade. He was a carpenter. He had calluses. He had to get splinters. 
He had to suffer the indignities of a human body so that he could offer his human body as a stand-in for ours and die for our sins. There was nothing he wouldn't do to humble himself if it meant saving you and me and doing the Father's will. Verse 7, he made himself nothing. He emptied himself, not of his deity. That's false doctrine. Jesus didn't do this as a man. He's always the God-man. The baby in the cradle is the king of the universe. He is God in the cradle, always and forever will be. And now he is raised to the highest place. That same baby who grew into a man is now the Lord, God, because he always was. Yeah. So uh, verse 7 is this. He didn't use that to grandstand. I love what John Stott said. He said he didn't use the glory of his deity as a platform for self-display. Right? God's version of self is to pour out. We give ourselves away. That's what life is, and that's how you find yourself. Right? And so... Yeah, the first advent, the first time around, he is gentle, meek, and mild, humble, man of sorrows, acquainted with grief because he's bearing the burdens of the sins of the world. But second time around, he comes back a little differently, a little more bold (laughs) at, at the second coming. And so being found in this first advent as a human being, there, you know, the incarnation, Luke chapter 1, I have a slide for that. God sends the angel Gabriel to to Nazareth to a virgin pledged to be married to Joseph. Mary, he says, greetings. You're highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary's freaked out. The angel says, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. You're going to conceive and give birth to a son. You're going to name him Jesus. He's going to be great, the son of the most high. How will this be? I'm a virgin. And then the answer, the Holy Spirit will be upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One be born to you will be called the Son of God. Fully human because born of Mary. Fully divine conceived of the Holy Spirit so that he could be a stand-in for us. As I told you before, a human man has sins of his own. He can't offer his life. He's a debtor too. Who's going to pay for his sins? So it couldn't just be a nice guy. And it couldn't be the Son of God without a body because he can't shed his blood and die. So what are we to do? Okay, I'll become one of them. That way we'll have the best of both worlds. Fully God, sinless, Fully man, sinless, offering uh, to stand in for our sins and to save us by dying there. You know, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinner reconciled. Amen. Uh, Let me show you one more thing before you all burst into applause. (laughs) First Peter 5 says this, clothe yourselves, all of you, it's a conspiracy, it's not just Paul, it's Peter and John, with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble, he quotes Proverbs 3, I don't know about you, life is hard enough for me without God opposing me, I don't want that, so he opposes the proud, he's working in the proud person's life to to bring them back to the earth, right, (laughs) Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand so that in the proper time, he'll exalt you. Now look what happens with Jesus there. Verse 9. Therefore, since he humbled himself to death, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that's above every name. I'll say, at the name of Jesus Wherever you are, on earth, in heaven, or under the earth, you're going to speak the truth and submit that Jesus is Lord and give glory to God the Father. And so now we've got that call to respond in the beginning to God's love and a call to imitate Jesus' mindset. And here's why, the exaltation of Christ. He's no longer on that cross that God always, spiritual law of the universe, 
will take somebody who's humbled their heart and lift them up in due time. That will always happen, and it happened in the life of Christ. The wording in the Greek is, is like God highly exalted him, super exalted him in the Greek. Exalted him with great exaltation there in the original language. As Hebrews chapter 7, 26 says, higher than the heavens. He exalted him higher than the heavens, man. I mean, as far as infinitely, eternally high you get, you'll find Jesus there reigning at the top. And so, you know what I like? I like when there's a picture in the Old Testament of a New Testament truth, and uh, they're called uh, types, prophetic foreshadowings. And nobody foreshadows Jesus more than the character of Joseph, one uh, number 11 of the 12 sons of Jacob. There are 103 ways that Joseph's life is preaching about Jesus. Let me tell you a few of them, right? So he's the object of envy with his Jewish brothers, which Jesus was, and they hate him because of how much the father favors him. You see the connection? And the father gives him this beautiful robe that they hate, and they tear it from him and dip it in blood, a robe dipped in blood. Come on, it sounds familiar. And... They toss him into the bottom of an empty cistern, left for dead. Now he's at the bottom, but he's raised up, and he's sold as a slave. Oh, now he's a servant slave, Joseph is. And then suddenly he gets it right with Pharaoh, this dream. He interprets the dream, and Pharaoh says, bring him up. And so up from the dungeon, he's exalted. Where does Pharaoh put him? To the highest Place. So Joseph is now in charge of Egypt, and the Pharaoh says, not one person in the realm of the Egyptian kingdom, which ruled the whole region, will lift a finger without your okay. And they put him in a chariot, and he had runners before, all hail, Joseph, make way, you see. And then on top of that, he gives him his signet ring. And now he's ruling, but he was this, this guy who humbled himself, never complained about it, did what he felt God was doing in his life, and God exalted him to the highest place. And there's a picture. And by the way, Pharaoh gives him a bride. She's a Gentile. Ah, oh, like Jesus. He, we, the Gentile church, is called the bride of Christ. And so there it's all laid out for the Jews there in the Old Testament. And it's really just the contrast. If you just look at Joseph's life before and then after, you see him going down the streets being pulled by the beautiful stallions and, and all of this and everybody screaming, make way, it's Joseph, the ruler of Egypt, right? What a contrast from just a few days earlier. Same with our Lord. What a contrast, the poverty to the riches, the shame to the glory that he had with God before the beginning of the world, from the weakness to the power, right? From a bed of hay, coming into the world and being laid in the manger, contrasted with coming into the world on the clouds of glory that every eye shall see, to quote him about his future return. How about this one? From a crown of thorns to the crown of of many crowns of Revelation 19. How about the cries, crucify him, away with him, to the hallelujah chorus that the angels are singing during Revelation 19, during the battle of Armageddon, the last battle. They're singing hallelujah to his name. And that... Um, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, the roar of rushing waters, peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns, and he shall reign forever and ever. That's a far cry from those cries to crucify him, battered beyond recognition on that cross, and when he comes again, wow, and what am I getting at? Well, those who follow Christ, who's humbled themselves, who have picked up their cross, 
who are enduring the world's uh, persecution, they follow an exalted Christ. They themselves are exalted. That what Jesus ends with is what you and I end with. He was exalted. We will be exalted as well. He says, I will raise you up on that day. I will honor those who serve me. And then he reigns on a throne. Guess what he says in Revelation 3, as I said, that whoever overcomes, he says, whoever's born of God will reign on my throne with me. And then Paul says, don't you guys realize we will judge the world. The world will stand before him and us. We're there. We're on thrones. We have words to say to them. Says the Bible, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And so here's what he's saying. He's saying the story doesn't end on the cross, meek and mild, dejected, and picking up my cross, and, you know, I've got to silence my mouth and all that. That's not where the story ends. There's resurrection, there's ascension, there's exaltation, and it's coming. And it's a reason to inspire you to know that I take the low road right now. It's very difficult, but there's a reward coming. And that that day is worth the humbling of my heart right now. That's what he says. Humble yourself under God's mighty hand. At the proper time, he will exalt you. And that proper time is coming. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you. It's hard to humble ourselves, Lord. But when we think about all of these things, it's a lot easier. So grace us with that understanding and help us do what's really hard to do without the intervention of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.